Okay, guys, let's start this uh, quite late. So yesterday, when we when we ended, we were near that uh, discussion of science, right? Yes. That's where we were ending. Okay, so is everyone clear about that? Yes, I think we can move on from there now. That I just have to go at, uh, go there because I missed it in the previous section, uh, the dis discussion of science. So it's pretty important, actually. I'm pretty sure this is not taught in any MBA program, but it's an important idea that you should have. Okay, so read this section once again. So remember falsifiability, and you can also see the connection between. You should also be able to see the connection, uh, and that connection is actually highlighted also in this uh, ebook. Okay, that there is a connection between a falsifiable statement, which is a scientific, the only truly scientific statement and a positive statement can you see the connection usually positive statements are statements of fact okay that the temperature in this room is below 30 celsius is that a scientific is that a falsifiable statement yes, yes right because you can take the temperature and see whether the remark is false or correct but if i say the temperature in this room is too cold that's that's a normative statement actually because i'm saying this is too cold some people might find it too yeah some people might find it too hot okay so those kind of you have to be careful the reason this is important even in a business school normally these things are taught in philosophy of science courses this idea of popper etc but uh, the reason it's important in a business school is in the world of business especially if you're in financial markets or even in other areas you'll find very often that people are talking all kinds of so-called experts are talking all kinds of uh, you know they're talking in very high polluting language but they're actually not making falsifiable statements so in general falsify the statements which are not falsifiable are not that useful okay because these are just global statements you know i think the market will go up or i think you know the dollar will be quite strong what's the meaning of that i mean quite quite strong what do you mean by quite strong going up by five percent thirty five percent forty five percent so these are all vague statements so a lot of these experts like i've asked you guys to watch uh, media you know follow them follow the news and in, in business media and things like that you'll find a lot of the experts who you need to do that because you need to be aware of what's going on but you'll notice also when you're looking at experts, you're listening to experts on TV, etc. Look out for this. Are they making statements when they prepare, when they purport to be talking about, you know, the outlook for markets or the outlook for the economy? The kind of statements they are making, are they making falsifiable statements? Yeah, yeah. Are they making falsifiable statements or are they making just global statements? Like I think the dollar will be quite weak or things like that, which is, you know, these are very subjective statements. So, so, so watch out for that because those kind of statements are not that useful. So as a, if you, if you, any of you go into, because one of the types of careers that you guys can consider is to go into business journalism. Okay. If you go with an MBA program, uh, with an MBA background, you can go into business journalism. It's quite lucrative because the anchors get paid a lot. And if you're interested in that kind of work. So one of the things you have to look out for as a business anchor is to press if you have a guest who's supposed to be an expert and he's talking in vague terms so you should press your guest to talk in more specific terms that's one of the things so you should be aware of this so it's an important idea that's why we um let's just yeah okay so we'll see this alarm seems to be a few seconds late but since we are here we'll we'll just so anyone who comes now will be absent let me just pause the see this alarm seems to be a the alarm is not going off. You want to hear what the aliens sound like? Okay. Okay. So let me just pause the recording. Yeah. All right. So yeah. So the importance of that, uh, the Popperian distri uh, distinction. Okay. And uh, so let's go back now. Let's continue towards the end. So what we have done with this um, did I discuss uh, utilitarianism in your class no. not yet okay so I think let's do this although we are not going to uh, you know I just want this to be let's we're going to put this in your syllabus but what I will tell you is that uh, since we are spending so much time discussing it we might as well put it in and it's useful for you to know these terms uh, if, you've, if you've done uh, a course on law you should know these terms so let's remove the italics and uh, so you don't have to I mean this there's a lot of information here it's actually taken from I, I forgot to put in the credit this is actually taken from a very good website a uh, couple of websites uh, I'll give you the links later on which I should have put in the links here itself okay so uh, all you need to know about ex ante and ex post is whether which is similar to uh, you know how does it match with the normative positive distinction okay 
on the uh, positivism, uh, formalism versus realism distinction. So a lot of it is actually explained there. So you should just have a broad understanding of that. It's important that you should be aware that you be aware of these terms, okay, ex ante, ex post, because this may come up in economics and other business related distinctions <laughs> as well, okay. So you can just read this. We broadly have I broadly explained this to you, right? That ex ante is basically uh, uh, essentially you take the is, is similar to the consequentialist perspective, okay, and it's similar to legal realism, where you try to think about. Uh, what will happen if we make this? What will be the consequences? Just like if you go back to the Shabana judgment, they were thinking about what would be the consequences if we decide the case in this way, and then they look at the consequences and they whether they like if they like it, then they rule in that particular way. Otherwise, they rule in a particular way, which uh, produces the consequences that they want. Okay, so therefore it is similar to realism. Okay, so th that is what is the ex ante perspective, and the ex post perspective is more like formalism, where the judge basically just looks at okay, what was the rule? And then, okay, where if you violated the rule, then you'll have to pay a penalty, and we don't really care about the consequences. Okay. So, uh, so this is basically the distinction. Just read up on it. The rest of it on your own. Okay. And then here, consequentialist versus deontological, and deontological is much more like the ex post perspective. It is much more like formalism. It is once again like uh, you you compare it to a code some kind of a set of laws or a moral code which you have violated and then you will accordingly face the punishment okay so you don't uh, we don't really care about the consequences of deciding in this way this is the rule and then if you violated the rule you will uh, you will face the consequences so it's much more like legal positivism much more like formalism okay and you know in a way you know the connection to the positive normative debate is a little bit uh, a little bit weaker but you can say this is the deontological perspective is more like the positive approach that you say that okay this is the law Okay, we don't really care about what the law should be because when you're going into the ex ante kind of discussion, okay, or the consequentialist kind of discussion, okay, like they did in the Shavano case, they actually started thinking about what should the law be because if the law is, if we, if we interpret the law to be just what the black letter law says, then we get a consequence where this woman is out on the street, okay, and she's, she has no way to, you know, fend for herself and that's not a good consequence. So therefore, we uh, we should rule in a different way which produces a, a better consequence whereas in a deontological perspective you don't really care about the consequences you just care about what the law says and you will rule according to the law if you have violated the law yeah so then what's the difference between ex post and deontological perspective it's very similar if you see if you read the notes actually that's why we are saying that these distinctions are all very similar that's why i'm discussing all of them together right from normative positive so deontological and exposed to the very similar kind of perspective okay so just that certain domains of the law where one term is used more than the other so you can just read this but you're right that they are the same okay they are basically on the same side whereas ex ante is much more like the consequentialist approach okay so therefore it is more similar it is uh, closer to the normative approach whereas this is more to, uh, closer to the positive approach we look at what the law is in the deontological perspective or the ex post perspective and then we rule accordingly okay so we don't really apply our mind to whether the law should be like this or it should be like that this is what it is okay and that's all we care about mm -hmm. all right so these are quite important i think as part of your uh, training uh, you should be aware of these kinds of uh, you know judicial philosophies so one important aspect of consequentialism which we should be aware of again this will have some kind of uh, connection to economics as well uh, when you make economic policy this is one of the philosophies that is often uh, you know sort of alluded to so there is this guy called jeremy bentham who is uh, known generally as the father of what is called utilitarianism okay so essentially what is utilitarianism it's it's the uh, it's the principle that uh, when you want to make when you want to when you're thinking about policy choices okay the policy that you choose should be the policy that produces the greatest good of the greatest number okay so um, let's say let's put it this way maybe the optimal uh, optimal policy choice you understand what is optimal right that is the one which we choose essentially so which is chosen to be the best policy so the optimal uh, a short, a brief definition of utilitarianism will be the optimal uh, let's call it let's make it quite specific into economics but you can actually look at uh, so let me not actually do that that would make it too restrictive uh, it can be any kind of policy it can be economic policy social policy Okay, like for instance, we have this new law, although we had section 125 CRPC already, 
but the Modi government has recently made a new law which is the maintenance, I don't remember the exact name, but it's the maintenance of uh, parents or something like that. So essentially it obli uh, obliges uh, children to maintain their parents. Okay, So this is obviously a social policy decision. You could have also decided not to make such a law, but they have chosen to make such a law. So when you, this is a social poli socio political po policy decision, more social actually. So they they make this. So if you are if you are following utilitarianism, you would make these kind of policy choices based on what will produce the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Okay, this is the idea behind utilitarianism. So the optimal policy choice uh, should be one that should be the one should be the one that produces the greatest good for uh, the greatest number of people okay. because normally our policy the people who are subject to the policies are the people all right so this is basically the idea so greatest good of the greatest Sometimes it's expressed as the greatest happiness of the greatest number, but this is the idea in utilitarianism. So it's an important concept to be aware of as business students. They'll be aware of this guy Jeremy Bentham and this utilitarianism. So utilitarianism is actually, can you see that it is very similar to consequentialism? Because you're always, you're already explicitly focused on the greatest good of the greatest number. Good means good as a kind of consequence. You could have also thought about producing the greatest bad for the greatest number. So that would also be a consequence. Okay, so it's a consequentialist approach because you keep tinkering with, you keep evaluating policy choices and you evaluate their consequences. So therefore, clearly it's a part of the consequentialist approach. Okay, so it is a specific type of, it's a specific subclass, you could say, of consequentialism, right? Where just like we said that textualism is a subclass of uh, formalism, okay? And, uh, or, and we also said that originalism is a subclass of textualism because originalism applies only to the constitutional uh, interpretations okay whereas textualism is a broad broader thing broader philosophy for all kinds of laws uh, not just the master law like the constitution so utilitarianism is basically this okay so it's a subclass of consequentialism so it's important to be aware of this because in many um, economic policy choices this this idea comes up okay and so the ontology also i broadly discussed so we can i think we can end this debate here uh, this is essentially all these things which are similar all these are very similar distinctions okay so you can see how many of them there are uh, and so this is this ends this particular module okay so we'll move on to the next uh, next part of the uh, uh, discussion which is this topic which is the next topic is the three organs of the state and the doctrine of separation of powers okay we haven't covered this in this class right okay all right so here this is the classical political science uh, doctrine some of you might have done it as political science in your political science classes so it actually originates from this guy from i think we might as well write his name here uh, this is actually comes from this guy called uh, montesquieu he's a french writer uh, i don't know how exactly to spell that uh, we got to check that this is obviously not the right spelling um, anyway, I, I check the right spelling and write it. His name is Baron Montes Baron de Montesquieu. I have to check that and I'll, I'll write it later. Okay, so I'll just put a question mark so I correct the spelling later on. Okay, so he talked about these uh, three um, three organs of the state. Okay, so you have the state and you have the three organs essentially the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. Okay, so you have to be careful about. We'll talk about their functions, but you have to be careful about how you speak about them okay so if you're going to use the word branch okay sometimes we say the three branches of the government or the three organs of the state so if you're going to use the word branch then you say legislative branch uh, executive branch and judicial branch you do not say judiciary branch okay or you do not say legislature branch okay so either you say legislative branch executive branch or judicial branch or you say the three organs of the state or three arms of government are the executive the legislative, uh, sorry, the, uh, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Are you following? Yes. So, if you're using the word judiciary, then it should be on its own. If you're using the word legislature, it should be on its own. But if you're using the word legislative or judicial, then you pair it with the word branch. Okay. But do not say a legislature branch or judiciary branch. Okay. So that's what you have to be careful about. The executive, the word executive, does not change. Okay. 
So, uh, if you look at the pure form of separation of the most, the country with the the, ma the one major country with the most uh, pure form of the separation of powers is the U.S. Okay, their separation of powers is much purer than what you see in England or India or Canada, Australia, etc. Okay, so what happens? Why is it purer? Because if you see the U.S., who's the head of the U.S. executive branch? The president. Okay, so you see that Donald Trump was separately elected. Okay, he is not he has nothing to do with the legislature. He never comes and sits in the legislature. Okay, so there's a direct election and a separate election for the head of the executive branch and then there are separate elections for the head of the heads of for the people who constitute the legislative branch. Okay, so that's why it's a much purer form of separation of powers and they are quite strict about it. And in fact, there's a very famous US uh, Supreme Court justice who has now passed away called Antonin Scalia and he actually mentioned why I mean, he was asked about why the US is such a free country okay it's still considered one of the countries where people have a lot of freedoms okay you can say whatever you want like in India if you see freedom of speech there are all kinds of restrictions okay on what you can say but in the US there's a lot more freedom of speech you can actually say all kinds of things there are people actually who are Nazis who are actually uh, saying things negative about the Jewish people but that's allowed under US law you can actually because there's tremendous freedom of there's a quite a lot of the, the idea of freedom of speech in the US is quite wide Okay, and you, as you know, they have the right to carry guns, etc. So they have a lot of freedoms. Individual liberty is quite high in the U.S. Okay, if you look at all the other countries. So uh, Justice Scalia was asked about what makes the U.S. or what has made the U.S. so successful, and what has made them where? Why is your liberty? Why is there so much personal liberty in the U.S.? And so the answer he gave was really that it all—it's all down to the separation of powers, because the powers are clearly separated, and there are checks and balances between you know each of the branches. So that essentially prevents any kind of tyranny. Okay, so the reason that Montesquieu came up with this idea of separation of powers is because he wanted to prevent tyranny. You understand what tyranny is? Tyranny is basically, you know, just one person's ruling in you know, an arbitrary way and usually not for the welfare of the people. So you could say that, you know, maybe you could say that uh, Saddam Hussein was a tyrant in his, his uh, you know, his in Iraq. You could, in many ways, you can say those who are being persecuted in China, they might say that the Chinese Communist Party is yeah. is tyrannical because they have complete control of everything. So more of a dictator. Yeah, like a dictator. Okay, so but dictator sometimes you can have theoretically, uh, you can have a benevolent dictator. Okay, who is a very good, uh, you know, king. For instance, a dictator like king, if you look at Samudra Gupta or Ashoka, these are all good kings. These are, they also had, uh, you know, absolute power. But they are generally seen as people who did a lot of good for the Akbar is also seen as a, a king who had a lot of power, but he's seen as a benevolent kind of dictator. But normally when we use the word tyrant, we use it in a completely negative sense. You never have a good tyrant. Okay, so the word uh, tyrant is always used in a negative sense. Okay, so you can think of maybe people like Saddam Hussein uh, as, as a tyrant. So uh, many people think that the current regime in Iran, the Ayatollah regime in Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran now, after they had the revolution in 79, that is also seen as a tyrant. You know, there are lots of protests, protests going on on the streets of Tehran. You know, sometimes you have these, uh, but they suppress them. So many people. So tyrannical means somebody who has a, a tyrant to someone who has absolute power and is generally oppressing his people, not doing good for his people. Okay. So essentially, what he said was the reason we have been able to prevent tyranny is because we have separated powers quite strictly, and so each of the branches acts as a check and balance on the other branch, and nobody has concentrated power. Okay, so if you look at the functions of the three branches, you'll understand this a little bit better. Okay, this, these are all important questions from political point of view and, and politics is actually quite important. If you see at the end of the day, it can affect your life. So, uh, you know, so, so if you see now, the, if you look at briefly look back at what the functions of the three branches are. So the legislative branch, what do, what do they have to do? They have to make laws, right? So all the laws that we have, like recently we had this, huh? Yeah, so parliament, you have parliament in India at the central at the central level and then you have the state legislatures, okay? So there is already in our constitution, there is a separation of uh, subject matter in terms in the union and the state lists and the concurrent lists. We have a separation of the states can rule on these matters and the central can rule on these matters. So they, they take their subject uh, domains in which they can make laws and the, the, the essentially the legislative branch is concerned with making the laws. Okay, so we had recently, if you see in the commercial realm, we had this. Uh, so now we'll have to start uh, implementing the negative marks. So Sejal and uh, Pragati, we are having a conference at the back. So we will have to start out with our first negative marks. Otherwise, this talking business will not end. Okay, 
Now, uh, Sejal and Pragati, are you in the same team? We have to find out where they are. Okay. Okay. So, Sahib is not opening his account. Okay. And where is uh, Sejal? Oh, same team. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, the rule we'll follow is the same team, two people talking. Uh, it will still be minus two, not minus four. So, generally, if you want to talk, you better talk with somebody on your own team. Yeah, so that you know you will minimize the systemic losses okay all right so this will I, I will take care of the formulae later but uh, this let this remain I, I, I'll just want to notch up the score so don't worry about the totals right now I'll correct this stuff on over the weekend so I just want to make this in bold all right okay okay so um, let's go back to this discussion okay so the legislatures uh, cons uh, legislature is concerned with making laws okay so recently we had this uh, in India, the, one of the most prominent uh, pieces of legislation recently has been the Insolvency and the Bank and Bankruptcy Code, which is called the IBC. It came in 2016. Okay, it's got quite it's quite a remarkable piece of legislation because all around the world, people are saying that this is one of the fastest pieces of legislation. Okay, but of course, we had to make a lot of amendments later. But it was introduced very quickly. The idea was mainly to clean up. You know what it's about, right? The IBC. You guys have to know about all this. You're not involved, you're not informed at all. You're not plugged in. I've told you to follow the Bloomberg Quint uh, website for Indian news because this stuff is happening every, almost every day. There's some news on the bankruptcy process because all these steel makers, many of these steel makers have gone bankrupt. There's a lot of tussle. There's a lot of tussle about uh, over tussle. There are, lot, there are tussles over, you know, taking over these bankrupt because this Archer Mitchell is trying to take over one of these steel, steel I think SR steels. Uh, plants and then some other people are uh, you know trying to fight with them over that so this stuff is going on all the time so this news you guys are not plugged in at all so you should have already heard about all this stuff your business students remember okay you're not like English literature students or something like that so you have to your postgraduate business students you need to be completely plugged into the to what is happening in the world of business both in India and internationally okay so the IBC is an example of uh, important legislation the insolvency and bankruptcy code it tries to speed up the bankruptcy process so the main idea was to essentially take uh, to to basically uh, quickly resolve the bad loan problem on the backs on the books of the public sector banks you know that the public sector banks have a very big bad loan problem so you have the high profile cases like vijay malia and king fisher and then you also have nirav modi okay all these cases but there are actually many other low profile cases also but there's a big big problem of uh, not performing assets on the back books of the public sector banks because you know there's obviously because it's a public sector this is one of the big mistakes that we have we have made and this is what indira gandhi did in i think 69 and 71 she did another brick and we never managed to reverse it so this as long as the, this is a massive drain on you know taxpayer funds this every year because every year these public sector banks have to be recapitalized okay and so there's a huge amount of money that is going in and there's still losses because obviously public sector no one cares if it had been a private sector bank, the losses are much le less, you know, because when it's your own money, you count even five paise. But public sector, no one cares, you know, it's just going here and there. So they, so there's a lot of corruption also. They bribe the officials and get loans when they're not eligible for them. So anyway, so the legislature is ta tasked with making laws, you know, understanding what the problems are in the country, what kind of laws need to be introduced and they make laws. Okay. The executive branch is, what are they supposed to do? Yeah. Bureaucrats implement the laws, okay, enforce the laws, okay. So the police is part of which branch? Executive, Executive branch, okay. So the police under the in India we have the system where the police is under the state government, but they are considered as part of the executive branch, okay. Although it's interesting that many of the laws that the police enforce, actually, if you see the main law that the police enforce, actually, is a central legislation. Although the police are under the state. And they are concerned, uh, considered to be part of the executive branch of the state, okay, other than union territories like Delhi. But ja largely they are under the state. But the main law that the police are enforcing, which is the Indian Penal Code, that is not a state law. There is no difference between West Bengal and Maharashtra or anything like that. That is a uh, central legislation that applies all over the country, okay. So the police enforce that. So the police are part of the executive branch. And of course, as, as Chug was saying, there's also these are all the bureaucrats. All the bureaucrats are considered part of the executive branch. Okay, so you have all the IS officers. Okay, and it, uh, you would also consider there are also certain bodies like Reserve Bank of India, SEBI. You heard of SEBI? Yes, sir. Okay, so all these, yeah, Securities and Exchange Board of India, which is the main securities regulator. 
So all of these would be considered as part of the executive branch. Okay, although these are actually considered as statutory authorities. But when you're looking at the scheme of government, you would still put them as part of the executive branch because they're largely answerable to the government. Okay, to the uh, so the head of the executive branch in India, who's the head of the executive branch? No, central government, but who, which person? Prime Minister, not technically speaking, the head of the executive branch in India, according to the constitution, is the president. Okay, but he's the what we call it as the de jure head. That is, uh, you know, there these two terms uh, that you should be aware of. Okay, de jure and de facto. Okay. Okay, and de jure means by law, and de facto means in fact. All right. Okay, so uh, the de jure head of the executive branch in India is the president of India, but the president is required to act according to the advice of the prime minister and the council of ministers. Okay, so it's actually, in fact, uh, you could say that de facto the head of the executive branch is essentially the prime minister. Okay, so this is basically uh, so you can also say that, you know, I think in that uh, in the days of Jahangir, the, the rumor was that actually Noor Jahan was making all the policy decisions. Okay, so you could say that the de jure head of the uh, of the kingdom was Jahangir, but the de facto head was Noor Jahan because she was actually pulling all the strings from behind. Okay, so that's how you use these terms. So anyway, uh, so what happens is the prime minister here essentially is uh, the de facto head of the executive branch. And in uh, the uh, the other thing to notice here is that in other countries that I mentioned, other in countries other than the U.S. Okay. You'll notice that we have a similar system in the UK, in Australia, Canada, etc. What happens is that you see that where, so let's say, Mr. Modi is the head of the executive branch, de facto head, okay, he's the prime minister, but he is also sitting in the uh, legislative in, in parliament, okay, when he has to vote on laws, he's also sitting in parliament, he's also an elected member of parliament, okay. So, what happens in most of these countries like India, UK, etc., is the head of the majority party in parliament becomes the prime minister. Okay, so which is the form, of, I mean, the de facto head of the executive branch. So whereas, uh, so so essentially, the prime the, the prime minister and these kinds of setup, he sits in he functions in both capacities. When he's sitting in parliament, he's functioning as part of the legislative branch. He's sitting and voting on parliament and debating laws, etc. Then he's part of the executive branch. But when he comes to the prime minister's office and issues directions as prime minister, etc., then he's part of the executive branch. Is this clear? So there is a certain amount of overlap in most of these countries like India, UK, etc. But you don't have that in the US where they have a much purer form of separation of powers. Okay. So and then so the job of the executive is really to enforce the law and this would include the statutory bodies like uh, so you have the, the, the prime minister and the cabinet. Okay. And then you have all the uh, other ministers of state, etc. And then you have the bureaucrats, and then all this, uh, the regulatory bodies, okay, like SEBI, RBI, etc. And then judiciary, in uh, judiciary, the role of the judiciary is to interpret. interpret the law, okay. So essentially, that's what we saw. So these are the, if you just sum up the three major functions, the three functions of the three branches of government is the legislature is supposed to make the laws, okay, the uh, executive branch is supposed to implement the laws, okay and enforce the laws and then the judiciary's job is to uh, interpret the law okay so now if you go back to the distinction that we discussed between uh, uh, legal formalism and legal realism okay if you go back to that distinction which of those two judicial philosophies formalism or realism which of those two philosophies do you think is more consistent with the separation of powers doctrine okay why why let's use the mic and let's hear the answer who wants to answer? You can answer. Answer, you were the one who, was, who you jumped out first. Okay. What's your No, no. Tell us what's the answer. Your answer is what? For formalism or realism? Realism. Okay. Why? Justify your answer. For the legislature, they make the law so they think of the consequences, think of the reality, which is what the need of the society, and then they make the law. So that is the realism part. And when we come to the judiciary, it is the formalism, they interpret it and they follow as it is written. Okay, so my question was really more about uh, on the focus on the judiciary because my question was between uh, legal formalism and legal realism, these two judicial philosophies when we compare these two, which of these two philosophies is uh, more consistent with the separation of powers doctrine? Okay, let's give Gulati the mic. 
although he doesn't really need a mic but he is <laughs> given the mic anyway let's follow the let's practice baton passing the baton yes so according to me realism uh, would be the better choice because with the separation of powers even the person who is giving uh, the uh, who is uh, making the decision your voice is not coming through the mic by the way yes. Yes. oh the mic is not working today no. okay i don't know why maybe they haven't switched it on or something like that okay anyway okay, okay let's not waste time now let's tell uh, just tell me what only yeah so you're saying realism is more consistent Yes. With uh, separation. the separation of powers doctrine, yes. why is that? So because uh, uh, they can also think about the consequences uh, before implementing the law. Who is they? The uh, the uh, uh, the judges. The judiciary. The judiciary is supposed to think about is can think about the consequences before implementing the law. Yes. But what does the what does the separation of powers doctrine uh, say about the role of the judiciary? They interpret the law while applying in a specific functional situation. Yeah, factual situations and, and pronouncing judgments in cases. Essentially applying the law, okay, interpreting the law. So why is realism more consistent with this? Because separation of powers says that the role of the judiciary is to interpret the law, right? Because it says the role of the legislature is to make the law, the role of the executive is to uh, enforce the law, and the judiciary's role is to interpret the law. And you're saying that realism is more consistent with this approach, with this uh, philosophy. Sir, uh, we can take the example of Shahabano case. Yes. They didn't implement the uh, <coughs> law blindly. Like they didn't implement, you mean, not implement it. They didn't implement, implement yeah. yeah. Like the legal form, uh, formula, sir. Sorry, I didn't Federalism, yeah. yeah. They just uh, reached it and then uh, they used the uh, philosophy of legal uh, realism and they implemented implement the law. Okay, okay, let's hear another answer. Anybody else has a view? Is my question clear? Between when you are comparing these two philosophies, judicial philosophies, that you, what you've understood, legal formalism and legal realism, and then what you've understood now about the doctrine of separation of powers, which clearly demarcates. Uh, the powers are the functions of the three branches of government okay between formalism and realism which of these two judicial philosophies is more consistent with the separation of powers doctrine that's my question is my question clear now okay so what is the answer so his answer is realism her answer was actually more mixed uh, but I got your answer what you said okay so anybody has uh, any other view Okay, so the uh, actually there is a correct answer in this case. Actually, the answer should be legal formalism because think about what the think about what the separation of powers doctrine says. It says that the role of the judiciary is to interpret the law. Does it say that is, they should be making the law? It doesn't say they should make the law. Okay, so that therefore the judiciary under the separation of powers doctrine they have a very specific and limited role. That is only to interpret the law, which means essentially if you go back to the definition of formalism. There you see it says that the role of the judge is to apply the law and not make the law. Okay, so interpret the law or apply the law in in the in a particular situation. So therefore, formalism is more consistent with the separation of powers doctrine. Okay, because here the judges are actually under formalism. They stick more to their classically defined role under the separation of powers doctrine, which is only to interpret the law. If you see in the Shabano case, they were not really interpreting the law in a uh, in a, in a faithful way. They actually decided that the law, if it was interpreted in a, faithful, uh, in, a, in a mechanical way, it will create a consequence which we consider to be socially undesirable. Okay, so therefore they essentially, in a way, they made the law. Okay, so they made the law, so they have rewritten the law. Okay, so this is sometimes referred to as legislating from the bench. Okay, so the bench where the judges sit, that's called the bench. Okay, and where the advocates are, that's called the bar. Okay, so that's why sometimes you have a legal website called bar and bench things like that so that's what it's referring to so the uh, so this is sometimes referred to as legislate what the supreme court is a case of legislating from the bench because they did not fo follow the law as it was strictly written down and they actually made a law in that particular situation they made a new law so they they were actually legislating from the bench so a person who believes in the strict separation of powers would not agree with that kind of approach because they would say that the judiciary is now stepping out of its bounds because under the separation of powers doctrine their role is only to interpret the law and and apply the law not to make the law okay so again you can see so that's why you'll see again as i mentioned to you earlier this is actually a debate which we should be having in a more public way in india but we don't really have this debate but in, the, in a country like the us you see there's a very active debate on this they actually select judges so if you see now donald trump as i told you his philosophy is he believes in formalism 
So he is actually selecting judges who believe in the same judicial philosophy. And in the US, judges tend to be much more consistent about whether they follow realism or, textu uh, or formalism. They tend to be much more consistent either way. Okay. So whereas in India, as I showed you from the two judgments of 1985, the same judge can waffle between formalism and realism within a month. Okay. And that person is actually the chief, chief justice of the Supreme Court. Okay. So uh, because this happens because we are not explicit about these philosophies and we don't discuss them openly. All right. So this is again something to be aware of that formalism as a judicial philosophy is much more consistent with the doctrine of separation of power. So if you go back to what I was saying about Antonin Scalia, who's the chief justice, uh, who was the justice of the US associate justice of the Supreme Court now no longer he's passed away. So he's considered one of the great justices of the Supreme Court in the US and he actually believes that the reason that the US has maintained so much personal liberty for its citizens is uh, because they had a strict separation of powers okay and there's a check and balance between the three branches of government okay the checks and balances and that's what has actually prevented tyranny so usually tyranny happens when now you know what tyranny is right okay so tyranny usually happens when there's a concentration of powers okay think about it like if I make the law if I make the law and I also uh, you know interpret the law then I have more power Whereas here, if you see the legislature makes the law and then the judiciary interprets the law. Okay, so you can see how checks. Yeah, sir, but uh, why in the theory of doctrine of uh, separation, uh, it is more uh, specifically stressed on to follow legal formulation, why not legal realism? If they have separated the powers mm -hmm. of every department, then still, why are they still making it to follow the legal formulation? Why not legal realism? No, because uh, see, this is under the doctrine of separation of powers, the classical doctrine of separation of powers. The role of the judiciary is only to interpret the law and apply the law in a, and it's implied that they're supposed to do it in a fairly mechanical way. The law as it is laid down by the legislature. Okay. Whereas uh, in if you apply legal realism as a judicial philosophy, in many cases, the judiciary would end up making the law. Like I gave you another example of the Delhi Rent Control Act, where one of the judges said where the legislature has written down in the in the act as it is, it says this particular provision applies only to residential premises okay now this particular judge basically decided on his own that no this is not the correct way to write the law i according to me this law should this provision should apply to even commercial premises now that's a big change because residential commercial is a very big difference so you can see here the how the if, so this judge obviously believes in whether he may under, whether he understands it or not whether he articulates it or not he obviously believes in legal realism so he's making the law as a judge because the legislature said only residential premises and he expands the scope to even commercial premises. So that's an example where a judge is actually making the law. But under the separation of powers doctrine, we don't see that as a role of the judge. Okay, the judge's role is only to interpret the law and not to make the law. Okay, so that's why we don't consider legal realism as being consistent with separation of powers. Okay, so you can see in the US, this has happened many times where lots of places where judges have made the law like abortion is I told you is a big debate in the US. So there was a decision called Roe versus Wade in the US many years ago, where the US Supreme Court essentially said that every woman has a fundamental right to abortion. Okay, whereas if you look at the US Constitution, where they have enumerated the rights, okay, there is no such right as a right to abortion. Okay, there is a right to life and a right to property and a right to liberty and all these things. But there is no right to so it's not written down anywhere in the uh, you know, Bill of Rights, etc., which they have. But so there's no formal law. But the Supreme Court basically just decided that uh, we are going to make this as a uh, as a fundamental right of every woman to have an abortion. Okay. So that's therefore that that's an example again of legal realism. So a, a judge who was following uh, the judicial philosophy of legal formalism would not have done that. Okay. So that bench, obviously, the majority of the judges, they believed in legal realism. Okay. So in fact, in the U.S., largely from the 1930s. There's been a strong movement in favor of legal realism, but only now today what is happening is with uh, Donald Trump has actually been able to appoint a lot of these uh, uh, formalist judges, people who believe they call them textualist judges because they use that term much more often in the US. So he's now trying to actually uh, tilt the balance in the federal courts, okay, towards more textualist judges who will basically believe more in formalism. Okay, so this is a tussle that is going on and uh, it's quite interesting to watch actually. So anyway, so is this clear now guys? Okay, separation of powers. Okay, now well, so this idea of the three branches of government, 
okay this is what you see in classical political science uh, doctrine okay now what you don't see but what, what I'm going to discuss that there is now the talk based because theory has to evolve to accept uh, theory must evolve to capture what is going on in the real world okay so one of the interesting things we have seen especially in a very uh, sort of egregious way since uh, Donald Trump was elected okay and, and the information that has come out since then if you see what has been happening now there's this I, have you guys heard this term called the deep state okay what I've written here the deep state let's go back a little bit now we have already seen the first now we are talking about now this you will never find in a political science textbook okay but I think it's an idea that you should be familiar with because it's a real possibility it has happened very much in the US but it and, and it can technically happen even in India okay so think about the executive branch of government what did we say that it includes the prime minister and the cabinet but it also includes all the bureaucrats like so all the IS officers okay then all the other RBI and all these other people say be everybody all the extended regulatory bodies okay so now this basically now what happens is see the prime minister and the cabinet obviously are uh, every election they are at risk okay they may not get re-elected in that case the prime minister will change okay and the cabinet also will change all the finance minister and home minister all of that will change okay but do you think that the IS officers will change okay they may transfer some of these people here and there they might get their pet officers like Modi got all the high performing guys from Gujarat and he got them to the center and all that because he trusts them so but that may happen but they, they still remain within the IS cadre. okay so this basically this now so you see that actually because those IS officers are not elected they are what we call unelected okay officials okay unelected officials and usually they serve uh, till they retire okay and so uh, so now this is what is called the deep state where essentially you have a some part of the executive branch of government okay some part because one part is kind of obviously elected so they are subject to the election cycle okay in India it's five years in the US it's four years okay in some parts of the US legislature it's every two years the House of Representatives in the US they have to stand for election every two years okay and in the Senate they have to stand every six years okay so there are some differences but let's say broadly about five years uh, four to five years Everybody is subject, the elected officials, the elected uh, po uh, politicians are subject to the uh, election cycle. Okay, they can get knocked out at any stage. But the unelected bureaucracy, the, the IS officers and all the other federal officers in the US, they are never, they actually uh, serve till they retire. Okay, and they are not elected. But they have a lot of power. Okay, they have a lot of power. So one of the things that happened in the US before this, during this election cycle is actually the, what is emerging as information now is that, the members of the FBI, because Trump had come out with a very strong statement about cutting the start, you know, the, the size of government and all that, cutting down the bureaucracy. So a lot of these guys did not like Trump. So what they were doing is they were actually spying on him, the FBI, the CIA and the NSA. They were spying on a president, presidential candidate. And even after he got elected, they were trying all kinds of, you know, tricks from behind, basically, because it's a big, the government is so big, you can't control it. Okay. So essentially, this is what has happened. This is what is called now the deep state. So this deep state essentially is the unelected. Okay, we can just call this here and just write it here. Unelected. Bureaucracy, um, which is a part of the executive branch. Okay. And so these guys have a lot of power. So they abused a lot of because you know the National Security Agency in the U.S. They collect in the name of monitoring terrorists. They are actually monitoring all the all the phone calls, every phone call, every email exchange, everything is being monitored. Not at a micro level. They they monitor the metadata. Okay, so if I'm like calling you and discussing, okay, let's plan a terrorist attack at this uh, you know the public square etc so the moment we say terrorist attack or we say bomb or something like that so those keywords are being captured okay so the metadata is being captured so the nsa is actually monitoring all the calls okay and then then they have a system of getting warrants okay so if they feel that they capture us uh, if they see us talking about some planned terrorist attack then they will go to the fisa court okay there's a foreign intelligence uh, surveillance act so they'll go to a court and get a warrant to further exam you know keep tabs on you and all that so all this stuff is going on but this machinery was actually abused so they actually abused this machinery and they started spying on the trump campaign even during the campaign and even after he was elected just imagine the audacity of these people a president elect somebody who has been elected president is serving in the transition and they are spying on him that's why he when he was and so one of the people in the deep state itself one of the NSA directors 
he went and informed uh, Donald Trump that this stuff is going on. So immediately he shifted his, uh, they were in Trump Tower and he shifted to a different location in, in New Jersey. So this is what was going on. So just imagine the audacity of the unelected bureaucrats that they're spying on a presidential candidate and then on a president elect. And even after he became president, they have been trying in many ways to undermine. Like if you see some of the stuff that is going on, uh, he had a call, Trump had a, dis a discussion with the Australian Prime Minister. Okay, he had a discussion with the Australian Prime Minister about some refugee exchange problem or something like that. And then the next day they had leaked the entire transcript of that call. Can you imagine? Say Modi has a conversation with the King of Saudi Arabia and somebody leaks the whole conversation to the press. So this should not be happening because obviously Australian Prime Minister, US President, they are talking that's confidential. Okay, But somebody basically in the network, they leak the conversation and it's very difficult to find out who actually did it because there are so many people involved. So this is what is going on. This is something that you should be aware of. As I told you, you should study the US because it's such a big country and such a developed country. You get to see all kinds of uh, interesting phenomena. Okay, And it will clearly remain the most dominant economic and military power even in your lifetime. Okay? That is why we have been told not to use the iPhone because even the Chinese are also trying to spy on this phone and call it. Could be, could be, could be. There was a report recently, it has not been substantiated, substantiated but there was a recent report on the Bloomberg that uh, the Chinese had actually infiltrated some through micro from small microchip they had inserted in, into hardware that was supplied to Apple and I think even Microsoft or some other people okay so some other organizations so there was like widespread infiltration so the US in fact recently has come out with a request to its allies not to use mm -hmm. Huawei uh, equipment okay so this so the, and so the US DOD stopped buying all this Lenovo and stuff all the stuff made in China they are all phasing it out even the companies like Apple Color, when their employees go to any country like China or any Southeast uh, countries, they are told to destroy their gadgets. So, if they are uh, traveling with an iMac or even an uh, iPad, they are told to destroy after they begin with them. Because earlier, when they used to go through the checking machine, the dating used to get leaked. So yeah, quite possible. Absolutely possible because mm -hmm. we know that China, this is one of the things that uh, the in the trade talks, okay, this is of course, this is pure espionage. But uh, in the trade talks, it says that there's, I mean, kind of a little bit of, uh, you know, overlap with this idea because they're also stealing a lot of intellectual property. So China has been doing a lot of stuff uh, in, in this uh, realm. But I was talking more about, that's a slightly tangential topic, okay. But I was talking more about the deep state to understand what, to give you flavor of what they've been doing. Okay, so this is something that technically I think that political science text, uh, textbooks should actually now incorporate this because we have seen this happening in a on a large scale, okay. So in, uh, technically it can happen even in India because you could actually have a case of you know some people in the you know in uh, our intelligence agencies because even here we monitor everything in, in fact we monitor much more in India without people knowing because we don't have all these kinds of uh, you know in the US the constitution there is a fourth amendment which gives you a right to privacy okay so they cannot search uh, your information without a reasonable cause without, without pro probable cause okay so if they want to take a if they if, so they need a warrant Okay, but in India, we don't have all these kinds of safeguards. So the government can search everything. Okay, so all your calls, everything you do, every site that you're surfing, everything technically the government, if there is a suspicion that you are involved in some kind of anti-national activity, they can actually search it. But the point is that as long as the people who are doing all this stuff at the, at the center are good, that's okay. But because all this monitoring is going, suppose that I'm some kind of a officer just like in, I'm in the you know national uh, informatics uh, center or somewhere and I don't like a particular political candidate I don't like their views okay I can actually try to monitor them abuse the power that is given to me and then I can try to monitor them and then use that information to their disadvantage so all this stuff can happen so you have to be aware of something called the deep state which is although we talk about three branches of government okay um, there is because we have seen the deep state in action big time in the US now in this particular after 2016 uh, during 2016 and also after 2016 so um, so this is just something to be aware of okay I've given you a little uh, news story you can read that okay all this stuff so a lot of stuff which we are discussing maybe not typically discussed in a legal uh, business law course but I think it's useful for you to have all this information okay okay guys all right so next go on to the let's any questions about this so far okay you should be familiar with this term called the deep state okay which is the unelected uh, fourth branch of government okay uh, so now uh, foundational legal theory we'll study a few terms again 
uh, let's just something that you have to be aware of okay read this book this article this uh, okay this this uh, article is in your folder the readings and statutes folder okay I've given a link also here if it doesn't work just go through the folder okay just read page one of this okay for your own homework uh, so essentially I just briefly explain what this is okay civil law essentially is what you see uh, in pre countries like uh, continental Europe essentially okay so and you also have it essentially in Japan Russia so it's what you see in, in Europe in, in Germany France all these countries okay this is what is called civil law and what you see in the Anglo-Saxon countries like uh, USA I mean, all the stuff that basically all the countries that are uh, former British colonies okay so UK obviously uh, itself and then Australia New Zealand Canada UK uh, USA India all these countries okay so we are called common law jurisdictions or common law countries okay so jurisdiction is just an area okay so the two terms that we use are essentially either we have a common law system or a civil law system okay we'll understand what they mean uh, but so the actually just get the nomenclature right so civil law is what you have in all these European countries the continental European countries and common law is what you have broadly in all the English colonies okay so uh, and what is the difference between and so the other term that we use is that civil law is an inquisitorial system whereas common law is an adversarial system okay so understand first what an adversarial system is you understand here that the system we follow which is the common law system okay so you have the two advocates when there's a dispute in the court the two advocates present the case for each of them uh, for their clients okay so they are like you know what adversary is right adversary means opponent right so adversarial so that means that there are two parties opposed to each other so that is what is meant by the adversarial system that each of the advocates will go and speak for their clients okay so they will present their arguments and then there will be counter arguments by the other side okay so they are functioning as adversaries to each other so all these common law countries australia new zealand india uh, uk all these are usa these are this is how the the system the, these are all adversarial uh, they follow the adversarial method okay of dispute resolution and so that means essentially two advocates argue the two sides okay and then the judge will decide who makes a more persuasive case and then under civil law systems like what you have in Germany France etc we call this an inquisitorial system because here you don't have two advocates as such okay arguing material okay normally the here what is happening is uh, the judge actually is driving everything so the ju judge will ask questions okay what did you do here can you show me these rent receipts okay can you show me the evidence of that particular uh, can you show me that uh, you know maybe the videotape of that incident so that uh, here the judge is actually conducting the whole uh, proceeding whereas in a common law system the judge is a little bit more passive okay he just listens to the argument okay and technically a judge is not uh, required to uh, you know make out a, a, a case for you so if your advocate does not mention a, a legal point which is actually in your favor okay the judge is not obligated to uh, you know mention that for you and take that into consideration he will just take what the advocate has uh, you know uh, presented okay and uh, he will just rule accordingly so if your advocate has not made a good case then the judge is not obligated to make that case for you okay but whereas in the inquisitorial system the judge plays a much more central role and he basically conducts an inquiry so it's like he's conducting an investigation okay that's how the system works okay so these are just some broad ideas that you should have okay as um, now another important thing which will come to uh, which is there in your the Landon Williams article also that the idea of the main difference between civil law and uh, common law systems is the importance of judicial precedent okay and the way we will understand what this means but the way this works is that in common law systems so the, the main difference is that in common law systems judicial precedent is uh, important whereas in civil law system is it's not important okay let me let's um, um, let me just write this down more explicitly so and here so this is how we distinguish between the two here judicial precedent is very important okay
that we'll understand what judicial uh, precedent is. So we are just at this point, we're just labeling things. Okay. Uh, we're not really going too much into what, uh, but uh, except for the part where we discuss inquisitorial and adversarial, we're just labeling things. We are just saying that there are two broad legal systems, two broad types of legal systems, civil law systems versus common law systems. And you know where they are. And common law is uh, an adversarial system, whereas civil law is an inquisitorial system. So inquisition essentially is a type of inquiry. Okay. You might have heard of this expression called the Spanish Inquisition. You know, those of you who studied history, there was a Spanish Inquisition, uh, you know, historically about, uh, you know, essentially to do with, uh, you know, enforcement of uh, Christianity and, and, and uh, things like that. So anyway, so uh, that was also a pretty uh, tyrannical kind of time during the Spanish Inquisition. But anyway, so inquisitorial means that essentially an inquiry, kind of aggressive kind of inquiry. So judicial precedent is another term that we are learning and we are learning that uh, civil law systems, judicial precedent is not important and in common law systems, judicial precedent is very important. Okay, so this is one of the important distinctions between the most important distinction between the two uh, systems. Uh, so let's understand what is, uh, 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 what is meant by, I'll come to this part. So judicial precedent essentially means, I'll just briefly explain what it is before we go into it in detail. Judicial precedent means essentially that you might have seen some of this in your uh, Glanville Williams article that once on a particular set of facts, okay, if we decide, if the ju judge decides a case in a particular way, okay, precedent, you understand what precedent is? Precedent, precedent means something that has happened before, uh, which is supposed to guide what is going to happen later, okay, that is the full meaning of the word precedent, okay. So, uh, therefore, judicial precedent means essentially that uh, the manner in which a case has been decided earlier. Okay, that is supposed to be important in determining how the same type of uh, case is decided in the future. Okay, that is what is the meaning of, we'll see more details of it, but that is broadly what it means. Okay, so the judicial precedent, the judicial decision on a particular case, okay, on a particular set of facts. Okay, if you see that there was a case where somebody has negligently, uh, you know, driven a car and run down somebody and that person has died. Okay. And then the judge based on the facts of the case where you have this guy with the judge notes that this person was driving negligently. Okay. And he has uh, caused, he has hit this person and then he has uh, led to that person that led to the person dying. Okay. Then on that set of facts, if the judge gives a particular decision that this person is guilty and he should have this kind of uh, liability. Okay. Then in the future, if you have a similar case where again, there is a person who is driving negligently and he runs down a person and the person die and the victim dies okay then the the meaning of judicial precedent is that the previous case however that was decided the current case or also it should be decided in the same way okay so it's essentially an argument for consistency you can see in one word if you want to sum up judicial precedent it is about consistency that on a particular set of facts one person is driving in negligently he runs down another person the victim dies and that person, the driver is given a certain penalty. Okay. And then in the future, if the same set of facts happens again. Then uh, the, uh, the idea is that the, the ruling should be consistent. The next in the, in the subsequent uh, case also, the ruling by the judge should follow what the previous ruling was. Okay. The same kind of penalty, same kind of liability. Is this point clear broadly? This is what is meant by judicial precedent. Okay. So it's essentially about consistency. So the point is that in civil law systems, we don't really care about this judicial precedent uh, aspect of it. Okay. The civil law systems, as you will see when you read that particular one, first page, okay, the civil law systems are very heavily codified systems. Codified means there's written law, uh, you know, and they are not, they're supposed to follow what the law is saying. Okay. And how a particular judge decided the same case earlier is not important to a civil law judge. Okay. Whereas in a common law tradition, judicial precedent is officially considered important. So you can go, that's why you know that uh, some of you might be aware that when we have cases in India, okay, which is a common law uh, jurisdiction, uh, there is a law when you're arguing a case, one very important aspect of your strategy is what kind of precedents are you going to cite? Okay, you will cite like if you're going again for a uh, fighting for maintenance for a Muslim woman who has been divorced by her husband, okay and does not have adequate uh, means to defend herself, uh, to maintain herself. So one of the precedents you will cite, cite is the Shabano case. Okay, so you'll see that here, you see, you're going to cite the, in the court, you're going to say, see, remember that there was a Shabano case and the court ruled in this particular way. So here also in my case, in, in the case of my client also, you should rule in the same way. 
and take care of uh, uh, this person okay so this is what is this is how so therefore in common law jurisdictions the whole uh, this is one of the reasons when uh, when you're going to uh, you're going to be studying judgments and then when you study the judgments you'll see that so many precedents are being cited and then the judges are discussing all the precedents okay so this is very important so you can actually in a common law jurisdiction you can actually use judicial precedent to bind the court you can actually say to the court that this court case has been decided like this in the past a case on similar facts has been decided like this in the fact so you are actually bound to decide my case also in the same way so you can actually put pressure on the judge by citing precedents okay that's why these are very important the precedents are very important in a common law jurisdiction but in a civil law jurisdiction you can't do that because they are not required to care about that okay every judge will reinterpret the law in his own way okay ideally to be faithful to the law but uh, they are just supposed to interpret the law as it is written down okay in the civil law systems and they are not supposed to be so worried about what the previous judge decided on a similar case okay so you can't put pressure on a civil law judge based on a previous ruling in the in the same type of case yeah. So, so in common law systems, uh, it will be more formalism or realism? No, common law systems uh, normally see co you can have both kinds of judicial philosophies within a common law system. But I understand why you're saying uh, you're probably asking this question because I said that in the civil law system, uh, they, are, they are more tied down by the law as it is written down and they are not so bo uh, bound by the judicial precedent, right? So you probably think that the civil law system is more likely to be a, uh, to be condu uh, conducive to or more likely to feature legal formalism, okay? So that's correct, that is correct. But in the common law systems, again, you can see here because the US is also a common law country, India is also a common law country and as you can see in India, both kinds of judicial philosophies are uh, prevalent yeah. okay even in the us so if you come back to your question okay that in a civil in a common law uh, system is it going to be more uh, uh, more uh, rep uh, sort of uh, characterized by legal realism or legal formalism and the answer is you really don't know it can be either way because the judges will subscribe because you have seen this in india itself that in the shabano case although we are a common law jurisdiction okay actually at that time there was no specific precedent on that particular type of issue okay but even in the future but there's still uh, judges are actually still able to if they believe in realism they're still able to bring their philosophy into the uh, into the way they decide the case by sort of reinterpreting the law somehow you know using some flexibility because judges have a lot of flexibility okay so they can use that in the US also you have this situation where um, Although they are also dealing with certain, you know, statutes that they have to interpret, okay, or a constitution. But in interpreting the constitution, as you can see in the Roe versus Wade, Wade case, abortion, there is not mentioned anywhere in the U.S. Constitution that abortion is a right. Okay, they have a lot of Bill of Rights, right to carry arms, right to keep and bear arms, that is explicitly mentioned. Okay, right to life, liberty, and uh, you know, um, uh, life, liberty, and property. You cannot deprive anybody of their, you know, we have also borrowed that from their constitution. Okay, but we have left out the property part. Okay, so in the US the Constitution, it says that no one can be deprived of their life, liberty, and, or, or property. Okay, without due process. Okay, so whereas in India, we have said only life and liberty, but the property we have left out. Okay, so all those rights are enumerated there in the US Constitution, but it doesn't say anything about right to abortion. Okay, but the, then the court just, as they were interpreting the uh, law, they just said, no, this is implied in the Constitution. There is something called a unenumerated right unenumerated means not written down okay not listed but they just kind of read into it read it into the constitution okay which is basically uh, the judges were using the flexibility that is given to them okay so that's basically the idea so you have some idea now about judicial precedent okay and it's very important in the Indian system okay now um, just briefly here explaining what this statement is that most, most modern common law systems are actually what we can call mixed systems okay now let me see uh, let me explain what i mean by mixed now if you look at the pure common law system it originates from england okay now in england when it was starting out when this common law system was starting out which is um, which is when uh, you remember william the conqueror have you guys heard of william the conqueror the invasion of normandy from uh, from uh, he actually is a norman king who invaded England okay in 1066 AD okay so around around 1100s or so William the Conqueror and the subsequent kings they started a system where the judges would start there was no codified law in England at that time 
so they would have a bench of judges who would be going around the country okay traveling around the country and giving decisions on various cases okay so this is how this common law system began because at that time there was no codified law like here we have the contract act the indian penal code all written down okay insolvency bankruptcy code etc we don't we didn't have all that all that stuff written down in, in england at that time so it was only what the judges were deciding as they were going around the country okay so uh, now what that's why judicial precedent became very important because you did not have any law that was written down so the only way you could decide the case is and you wanted to be consistent so you had to basically follow the way that judges had decided in earlier in earlier similar cases okay so that's all there was there was a bunch of judges going around the country okay riding circuit as they as they called it and they were riding around the country and they were looking at all the disputes and so they would go and gather in a particular place in the town square or somewhere and all the disputes would be brought to them and they would decide those disputes and then they would move on to another place okay so the all that you had was essentially the decisions of the judges on those particular cases okay and slowly those decisions started to get written down okay initially so basically whatever they were deciding whatever judgment they gave like this guy has stolen a horse so let him be given 35 strokes of the cane or something like that okay so you give a particular punishment okay and then essentially obviously consistency becomes a requirement uh, almost everywhere so as those decisions started to get written down the future judges started to follow the decisions of the previous judges okay for the essentially for the sake of being consistent so that's why that's where the this is what was called the common law so when we say common law jurisdictions today the pure form of common law essentially has no written down laws no contract act or property transfer of property act or this that registration act nothing is there only all you have to go by are the previous decisions of judges on similar matters okay and these decisions started to get written down and they started to keep a record of those uh, judgments okay so that is the pure form of the common law system okay so this is why i say that most of the modern countries where we say that there is a common law jurisdiction like we say australia new zealand canada us india these are all common law countries but technically they are not like pure common law jurisdictions in the sense that we don't have any codified laws okay so we still follow it's a common law these are all common law jurisdictions because in all of these countries if you are arguing a case you can use judicial precedents to put pressure on the judge to rule in your favor that's why these are all common law called these are all called common law countries but they are also kind of technically they are now mixed jurisdictions because in all these countries you also have uh, written statutes which have been written down by the legislature okay remember so because earlier in the pure form of the common law system in england the legislature was not really playing any role because that time there was no legislature because the king was the legislature okay so the king was basically in charge of everything okay so the king used to send out his group of his uh, team of judges to go around the country instead of everything coming to the king and the king having to decide so the king would designate a bunch of people then you be a judge and you go travel around the country so that you know there is one consistent law common law means one common law for the whole of england okay so the instead of the king deciding everything he had basically delegated this power to decide to all the judges and they would go around and that was the pure common law system where there is no written down law and all you have is the judgments of these judges on previous cases okay that's the pure form of the law because that time there was no legislature so now as this modern form of government developed where you have the three branches of government where the legislature has an explicit duty to make laws okay they have an explicit duty to make laws all right so if you go back here to the here the legislature now has an ex ex explicit duty to make laws so in most of these countries australia new zealand canada india you have uh, both you have the rule of judicial precedent still remains because we come from a common law tradition so we have maintained that uh, rule okay but we also have now a legislature so the legislature will come out with various acts okay like hindu marriage act etc so there now those acts so when the judges when there is a decision to be made about a hindu marriage okay whether a person is entitled to a divorce and things like that that will be decided according to the law laid down by the legislature okay but it will be mixed it will be also the law laid down by the legislature but also how the court has ruled on a similar matter in the past so both judicial precedents will be used as well as the written down law will be used what we call the codified law okay are you guys following this is kind of abstract uh, historical matter but are you following or is everybody blanking out drishti you are following okay so is is uh, 
is this more or less clear what we are discussing okay just just to get some of these uh, historical things uh, in perspective and understand how our system works so it's it's still uh, so that's why I'm calling it a mixed system. It's not a pure common law system because that would mean that there is no law made by the legislature. Okay, but it's a kind of a mixed system, although we call it a common law system, we don't call it a mixed system. Okay, but that's why I said that these are actually now kind of mixed systems. All right, yeah, so there is a lot of codified law. Okay, so that's why I said here any given case decided by reference to both codified law and judicial precedent in a common law jurisdiction okay right codified law includes amendments amendments apply okay you understand the difference between prospective and re retrospective okay what is prospective which is forward looking and which is backward looking yeah so retrospective is backward looking and prospective means forward looking okay so some of the amendments can be actually retrospective also like for instance when you heard of the famous Vodafone case Tax. where the big tax, tax case tax. okay so 11 uh, so huge amount of money involved okay which is still going on actually the dispute is still going on that is the case that the government of India actually lost okay the revenue department lost in 2012 in the Supreme Court but after that there was an amendment through the Finance Act of 2012 there were some amendments made to the uh, Income Tax Act which essentially retrospectively amended the income tax laws in such a way that it basically completely nullified the victory of Vodafone in the Supreme Court. So whatever the Supreme Court had ruled, you know, whatever they had said in favor of Supreme uh, of Vodafone, the government wrote, went back and rewrote. They essentially the whole Finance Act of 2012 is largely based on the Vodafone judgment. So they took whatever the Supreme Court said and said essentially they said no, no, no. This was <laughs> they nullified all this. Okay, which happens in a lot of cases in India, which is very unfortunate because actually it undermines. In the short term, it looks like the government has gained a victory, but actually it's bad for the system because it creates uncertainty among international investors. We need a lot of investors to come in, pump money into the country. So it's not a good practice. But sir, that was essential for the country. No, no, I don't think it was essential. There were certain loopholes that were taken advantage of, which shouldn't have been. No, 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 no. It was not. Uh, it was basically, it was a formalist judgment. It was not a loophole as such. It was a formal. You can read the judgment. There's a huge judgment. There's a pretty long judgment. You can read the judgment. That is what many people have said. But the point is, it doesn't matter because you have a system. So if the Supreme Court rule, we have already put the Supreme Court as the highest court in the land. Okay. So this is what Narayan Murthy also said that once the Supreme Court has ruled in a particular manner, we should accept that whatever they have said. And it's not a nonsensical ruling. It is a lot of logic. It's a formalist ruling. Their ruling is a formalist ruling. Okay, when you see later on, uh, we look some parts in company law. You'll see the same principle being applied. It's a formalist ruling. It's a perfectly reasonable ruling. But the more important consideration is whatever it is. Like some Supreme Court in certain cases has ruled in ways which many people did not like. Okay, Shabano case is one example. Okay, where large parts of the Muslim con uh, uh, community did not like the ruling. But the point is that we have given the Supreme Court the position of the highest court in the land. Now, once you've given them the position, then you should not undermine their authority. Once they've given a decision, you should accept that. Because then if you go back and amend the law in such a way that you make a mockery, it makes a mockery of a Supreme Court decision, which means essentially nobody can win a big tax case against the government. That's what it means. Because if the amount is sufficiently big, okay, if the amount is sufficiently big, then the government will always go back and change the law retrospectively to make sure that the judgment is nullified. Because right now, even today, the government is pressing Vodafone for that amount okay which technically I would say they are not entitled to because the Supreme Court has already ruled that the government is not entitled to that amount so then you are undermining your own system for the sake of short-term gains so even that amount that they have levied if, if you don't if, uh, as the Supreme Court said that that is not a very bad that's not a valid levy so what are you actually claiming I mean on what basis are you claiming so so there are a lot of problems and this creates a very bad impression among international investors that you know if the government can arbitrarily change the law because we have to be seen as a nation of laws that there is a certain predictability and there is a legal system that is one of the reasons why many people many investors prefer india over china because india is seen as a more transparent country more of a rule of law country where the government many times loses cases in the supreme court can you imagine chinese government losing a case in a chinese supreme court it will never happen okay so those judges will no longer be alive if they rule against the government so the so that is one of the reasons why india is favored to china by many uh, investors so we have to maintain that we are now 
actually are, we are a western style liberal democracy that is how we have uh, fashioned the country which is a perfectly fine way to go it doesn't mean that we are giving up our traditions and culture everything is perfectly alive you can see that all our tradition of music and dance literature everything is perfectly alive and we have made a nice transition into a western style liberal democracy which is but and then we have to use that system for our own economic development so this is not a good thing this is a short term uh, benefit but eventually it, it will scare away foreign investors okay if we do this okay guys let's uh, so this is this clear codified law amendments some are retrospective some are prospective okay all right now uh, this is a hierarchy of courts you can just listen to this is just uh, uh, the uh, i've just given you a, uh, a presentation i'm not going to go through this because it's kind of mechanical this is uh, available on the internet you can just read it for yourself just to get an idea so this is kind of mechanical okay district court high court point is that the, you know what a hierarchy is it's a structure some kind of high like you have a hierarchy in the army you have a major general general all this kind of thing then lower and you have corporal and all these people so hierarchy is like kind of a, a kind of order okay an ordered listing so you have a hierarchy of courts obviously district court high court okay yeah top to bottom kind of listing and then you have the supreme court on top now this hierarchy of courts is also connected to the idea now we're going to study the idea of judicial precedent in greater detail okay now this um, this is a latin term stare decisis which is another way of referring to the doctrine of judicial precedent okay so remember that whole thing at the end of the day is all about consistency okay so judicial precedent it's called stare decisis essentially means that uh, you know whatever has been decided let it stand that is basically the idea the loose translation of this latin expression stare decisis so that is essentially the doctrine of judicial precedent so the idea there is that uh, because we want we want we put a lot uh, we put a very high value on consistency so we want that the judicial system should function in such a way that on a certain set of facts if a previous judge has given a particular type of ruling later on when the same set of facts happens okay or uh, transpires the next judge should also rule in the same way okay as far as possible okay it's not an ironclad rule there are some exceptions where you can if you feel that the earlier ruling was very wrong or something like that but by and large we try to follow this system by default we try to follow the system so a judge will clearly say that you'll see in many of your judgments which you study that the judge will say okay this is the problem before me well this is not, not a very difficult decision to make because uh, there is already a precedent of the supreme court on this particular issue so i will just mechanically apply that precedent and solve this case okay it will be just decided in the same way okay so that is what stare decisis is and it's all about consistency okay and once again this ties into the role of a legal system this is consistent with the view where you see the legal system you know what you can think about many ways i mean uh, you know like again this connects to formalism and realism etc but one of the views of the legal system and the role of the legal system is that it is supposed to foster an environment of certainty and stability okay because at the end of the day if you look at any country economics becomes everything if you don't have economic development at the end of the day you have nothing okay so uh, therefore to foster economic development you need to produce an environment of stability and certainty for businesses okay at least on on the tax laws and other regulations and stuff like that so that uh, they are able to make long term plans okay even economic uncertainty is always there but at least on the regulatory side on the tax side the government should provide stability and certainty so businesses can plan long term so that's why uh, this is one of the reasons why stare decisis becomes important because it is also consistent uh, it is also in line with the idea of consistency stability and predictability are you able to see that connection that if you have a rule like judicial precedent or stare decisis and you are forcing judges to decide uh, future cases in the same way that previous similar cases were decided that is fostering consistency can you see that it is conducive to consistency in rulings okay so that's why it is basically tying in with a larger vision of the role of the legal system being to create a stable and predictable kind of environment so that businesses can prosper and even people can go about their you know lives in the same way okay like if you have a rule saying okay you have the law on the book saying under uh, 497 ipc adultery is a crime so anybody who is contemplating doing something like that he would actually look at the law and he can guide his conduct in the right way he can say that okay i should not do this because i will i might be punished okay so this is how so it's not just businesses but also people can plan their conduct okay by looking at the legal system and seeing what the law says what you should and should not do okay so um, 
so this is stuff general stuff here okay now some terms on stare decisis which we are going to uh, be uh, you know study okay which is vertical versus horizontal stare decisis okay if you see uh, you can see this vertical stare decisis both are connected to the hierarchy of courts so in India we have uh, the Supreme Court on top and then we have all the high courts in all the different states okay so when you have vertical stare decisis you're talking about a uh, higher court up uh, higher court I mean a lower court following the uh, the precedence set by the higher court okay so any kind of situation where a district court is following the precedent set let's say a district court in West Bengal is following a, a decision earlier laid down by the Calcutta High Court okay so that will be a case of vertical stare decisis is this clear because it is related to the hierarchy of courts if you go down vertically that means you're going from Supreme Court down to uh, the High Court down to the district court people are getting restless let's check the time okay once again al alarm is not working what is happening rooster has failed us huh? volume anyway you guys can go now I'll check what is happening here what is all of your minds sorry <laughs> no I think next time what I'll do is I'll ask some, um, somebody to put an alarm on their uh, <laughs> okay good good so I'll apply a time I'll appoint a timekeeper but you should not set the alarm earlier at 10 45 <laughs> Okay, guys. Okay.